Welcome to the podcast is dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The ask a cycling coach podcast presented by trainer road. I'm coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Zimmerman, Hi, everybody. And we also have ha- oh, hand up pl- plus the black Bibs racing's IV drain. <laughs> Dang it. I even I wrote this thing out. I get stage fright. I, every <laughs> time I have to say it, <laughs> then I'm going to screw it up. I wrote it down. I knew it. And I screwed it up. I'm sorry, Ivy. How are you? Okay. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> great. Great. How many more cyclocross races are you doing this year? You're kind of getting toward the latter, like, I guess, latter month really yeah. for us here in the U S of the season. Yeah. Um, well, first I have a track cross race this weekend. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. In Chad Sacramento. just looks confused. Can you, no, what is that? Can you explain <laughs> track oh, cross? No. <laughs> Track low uh, cross. Mm-hmm. Well, no, track Chad, low. take an unsafe bike and put it in unsafe conditions and <laughs> race it as fast as you can. That's awesome. So um, Squid makes a bike called the So Easy. It's a track steel track frame with some more tire clearance. So you put like cross tires or gravel tires on it and it's fixed gear. So to control your speed, you skid and, and then you go do cycle cross. It's <laughs> totally silly and <laughs> ridiculous. But Looks it's so terrifying. Fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, I'll there's, do that. <laughs> there's good memes about this, about track lacrosse on, <laughs> on the internet as well. So yeah, yeah it's becoming a cultural <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> Yeah. How we're like the stepchild that everybody hides. And <laughs> so what's your daughter up to these days? Mm. <laughs> she went to boarding school. She's <laughs> <At> 22 years <laughs> of age. Oh, that's awesome. Well, it's good to have you, Ivy. Um, are you going to do, uh, are you going to go to, I know we talked about this before, but are your plans to go to cyclocross world champs, even though you're not likely to be selected for the world champs team, but are you planning to go or to experience it? I'd like to, uh, there are a couple of sponsors that maybe we're going to have me along to just go give high fives and, and be there. So if I can do that, I certainly will. It'll be really cool. But other than, other than that, it's just nationals for me and then I'll wrap it up. I feel like if you're listening to this and you would be into this, let us know. I feel like we should uh, maybe even consider having like pit reporter Ivy uh, on, <laughs> on <laughs> in place to give us behind the scenes content. It would be hilarious. I would love it. So yeah, at world champs, like maybe you can go ask Vanderpool, but he thinks about track lacrosse. I'm sure he'd have a great answer for that. So yeah, yeah definitely. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, Put me in good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, um, I'm going to jump right into a question by Phil. Uh, it has to do with adaptive training. He says, I'm 57 and an avid cyclist. I do epic events, but don't race. I recently, which is awesome, by the way, good on you, Phil. I recently did an FTP test after my first block and it went from 290 to 322. Way to go. That's super impressive. Uh, that's a lot of, that's a lot of improvement. And anytime, no matter your weight, anytime you cross that, uh, 300 watt threshold, so to speak, you know, you're big day. Yeah. Yeah. Big day. That's exciting. So way to go. My problem is that I can't seem to finish my workouts anymore with a new FTP. Should I lower my FTP so I can complete the workouts or keep trying? I work lots of hours, but attempt to stay on track with every workout. So we've gotten a handful of, or we've gotten, you know, questions like this for as long as trainer road has and cycling has existed probably right. In the sense that athletes get a new threshold. Then after that, things are hard to do. And that's what adaptive training is designed for. So in my mind, I'm like, hold on here. Is he using adaptive training and why isn't it working? If that's the case, uh, which it just works. Like you can't really make it not work. It just, it works. (laughs) That's how it works. So anyways, I looked into his account. And for so many of you that have sent in messages to me on Instagram or anything else that may have feel like you have a similar situation, let Phil's story be an example here. So great job. Now I dug into your account. I looked into everything and here's what I found. So Phil, (laughs) yeah, I apologize. Uh, (laughs) But Phil, you say when your FTP went up, adaptive training adjusted your progression levels to give you achievable and productive workouts. So what happens is let's say I'm at 290 Watts like Phil. And then I retest and I'm at 322. That's a big jump. Depending on the sort of jump that you get, or even the reduction in FTP, you will get adjusted progression levels after that with adaptive training. So if you're, let's say your sweet spot capabilities where you were at a level seven, or in this case, I believe it was a 6.8 or 6.9 was what Phil had. If he's at that level, 
after he gets that huge bump in FTP, he is not going to be a 6.9 still because he wouldn't be able to complete 6.9 level workouts at that new high FTP, right? So in this case, he actually got bumped down to a 1.9 uh, for that. So with that in mind, that's what happens. You take that, you get a new FTP, and if it goes up, your levels go down and they go down a specific amount for you that's calculated. So in this case, it drops down to give you those productive and achievable workouts instead of just running you into the ground with aerobic work that's actually very much anaerobic until it's aerobic. So with that understood, adaptive training then suggested, and I looked through your workout history, adaptive training then suggested adaptations to your training plan, but you ignored them. So <laughs> when you get adaptive training, yeah, sad face. Um, when you get, it basically says adaptations pending and down on the calendar or on your career page or in the app, it'll say that, right? And it said adaptations pending and even a, like a pop-up will come up for you. And in this case, in this case, you either hit ignore or you clicked on them. Then you hit ignore, whatever you did, you ignored them. And then you failed a level 6.2 sweet spot workout because you were a level 1.9, which totally makes sense, right? You shouldn't be able to complete a level six if you are a level 1.9. It's like, it's like just ignoring your coach's advice. It's like, yeah, coach, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. then wondering why your coach's advice didn't get you where you wanted to be. Yeah. Yep. Then you ignored more adaptations after that sad day again, and you failed more workouts after that. Then finally you accepted the adaptations and you got the workout that adaptive training was trying to suggest to you on day one. And guess what? You nailed it and you rated it as moderate, which is awesome. So it seems like, and that was, uh, you submitted this question before you accepted those adaptations and move forward. So, uh, in this case, the lesson is Adaptive training doesn't work unless you accept the suggested adaptations. I know that sounds really silly, uh, like super obvious, but it's a really important thing to remember. Uh, when you look at it, know that adaptive training is built on millions and millions and millions of workout records. We have over 120 million workout records in our database and it's constantly increasing in size. So it's based on millions of data points here. And it's looking at that and looking at your recent performance, analyzing how you're doing to then make those adjustments. Uh, so when it, you get adaptations, go for it. I promise you, it's not going to be something that's like, eh, I think I know better and I shouldn't trust this. This is where you should go. Um, it's going to lead you in the right path. And look, now you're on the right path, Phil. You're nailing workouts again, uh, checking them off and getting faster. So congratulations. Um, Mark has a question that kind of relates to adaptive training as well. That has some interesting points. He says, I'm a recent new user and so far very happy. Lots to keep me interested. During warm weather here in Ontario, Canada, I've been doing two workouts a week on the trainer and my weekend workout on a low, and he mentions that he's on a low volume plan outside. Well, I have a smart trainer. I don't use a power meter outside. So at the moment I'm using RPE, which is awesome. By the way, you can just use RPE based workouts. So that means that instead of doing your sweet spot work, which is going to be like a level seven or 6.5, something like that out of 10. Uh, instead of doing it with power, you can just say, okay, this interval is going to be 6.5 out of 10 for 15 minutes. And then I cruise and then I'd repeat that. And it gives you all those power targets. Super cool. Makes it accessible because not all of us can have power meters on every bike. Uh, that's a big expense. So Mark says, have you considered using on trainer history to correlate to RPE? By now you have lots of history of heart rate as compared to power output, or he says, or lack thereof. <laughs> Uh, he says it wouldn't be applicable directly on the bike because of day-to-day -day variation and heart rate as compared to RPE, but it might be useful post hoc to give an idea of where the workout actually sat in terms of productivity. And he says, I think the gain might be this. Some days I think I was working hard. However, historical data was comparing my heart rate to smart trainer power might be useful to say I was, or wasn't. Thanks again. So Mark, we are actually doing this. Um, we're collecting this data. And we're building up uh, different ways to be able to get a better fix for stress that you have going on. Um, our system can also estimate TSS based off of that right now, which is pretty cool. So it can estimate based on the heart rate that you had, it can estimate what the TSS is. And moving forward, we do plan on using that and even more metrics uh, to get even more cool insights. So. Once again, adaptive training is not done. It never will be done. It's just, this is how we are going to build up this incredible way to train people and make people faster in a more productive way than before. So setting stuff, Ivy. 
Oh, in the year something. in the year 2030, Twinner will be able to measure your serotonin before you start your workout and <laughs> make adjustments accordingly. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I'm sure that some sort of device measurement will come out for that, you know, and if it's good, then yeah, I mean, we're interested in it. So serotonin device creators, let me know. Uh, I want to, <laughs> I want to talk really quick about Xterra world championships It's coming up this weekend. I'm taking vacation for a week, uh, with the family and we're going there. Uh, we're going there to support our friends, the Peachels. So good luck, Shelly. Uh, she's going to be racing this. I think I made some sort of a bet a long time ago with her that I've joked that she went for a run and I was like, be careful. You keep doing that. You might turn into a triathlete. And, uh, sure enough, she has turned into one heck of a triathlete and she's a really good mountain biker too. And she qualified for world. So we're going to support her as good friends do. They make the, you know, the sacrifice to go to Hawaii to support their friends. Um, but we're going to support her and also our COO, Brandon and my Cape Epic partner, he's going to race too. So, uh, it's kind of exciting. Chad, you've never done triathlon. You've done duathlon, mm -hmm. but you've never done triathlon, right? No, no. I, I trained for it and then got injured and, and it's kind of worked in my favor because I probably would have drowned my, my swimming. <laughs> I, I think you've already recognized this. You, you were, con, you're kicking around the idea of going and just giving it a shot since entry uh -huh. is, is allowing access to, to people who didn't, didn't necessarily qualify. But I think you recognize that not only is it an ocean swim, but it's, it's going to be pretty hairy weather on the, on the day. Yeah. And there is, there's a legitimate chance of drowning in, in situations like that. If you're not a solid swimmer, not trying to put anybody off and make them worry about the fact that they're, they're doing an ocean swim. If you're a good swimmer, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But I hadn't ascended to the heights that, that I think I needed in, in order to, I mean, it was just a, Jesus, just an Olympic distance. And I still think I would have drowned. So I, I wasn't exactly on track to handle the swim very well. And that doesn't really set you up for the, for the bike and the run. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I, I, I thought about it because like you said, anybody can actually race it this year because they didn't have enough qualifying races to fill up the event uh, due to COVID. And now there's even more slots probably open because of recent developments with that and a lot of countries being banned to travel to the US and Hawaii. So really complex. So I thought about it and then I was like, oh, so that's how you'd meet your death. And I decided I didn't want to do that yet. So, um, but Ivy... <laughs> Have you uh -huh. done track? You've done <laughs> road racing, mountain biking, track racing, track low cross racing. I think I mentioned cyclocross. Have you done yeah. triathlon? <laughs> uh, it wasn't a triathlon. I guess it was a duathlon. It's just bike and run, right? Okay. Uh huh. Yep. Run, was bike, one of my first competitive cycling events. Um, like I just stopped playing volleyball and was getting into riding and he was in Montana outside of Missoula. It was an off-road event. So, um, nice. a little bit of single track and then a pretty short run, a, a couple miles. It was like, a, it was a fun event. It was, yeah, nothing serious. And so some buddies convinced me to try it and borrowed a mountain bike. And not only was I not an experienced rider or endurance athlete in any way, I had no business being there other than for fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I had like no idea how to recognize like trail markings or, you know, things that you just pick up on when you start riding trail a lot, like, oh, we're going to hop on this like double track for a minute. And then the trail very obviously veers off to the right. Um, I didn't pick up on cues such as that and miss a turn <laughs> and ended up riding on double track fire roads for like three hours there was a are you lost <laughs> oh for sure super lost. just kept going though. yeah super lost. it's like i, didn't, I had no I idea i and... couldn't possibly have missed a turn <laughs> they, it's amazing uh there was you know the the ride the whole portion was five or ten miles or something maybe but <laughs> i had no context hours. i didn't know what that was like would it take yeah. me four hours would it Fair. take me one i don't know yeah. so i just kept riding <laughs> I made a loop and finally someone who was looking for me found me like half a mile before the finish and they're like you are ivy aren't you and i was like yes <laughs> am i late they were like yeah you're <laughs> but we were glad you were here and alive and i <laughs> oh my gosh got back and everyone was barbecuing and you know de super done and the finish line was gone <laughs> oh yeah for sure <laughs> yeah. but 
my buddy took me on the run though. It was, it was really short and I wanted to finish. So we just, we did it and it was great. Heck yeah. I can't That's believe awesome. I continued in any endurance sports after that. And it should have <laughs> yeah, been an omen. I should have listened. <laughs> and so was born the, the endurance athlete that is <laughs> Ivy. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. No bear encounters either, because that would be kind of scary. Like, uh, yeah, you know, nothing up in like that, that Missoula, plenty yeah. of bears up there. So, wow. <laughs> Yeah. So I am not going to meet, uh, my fate there at the, at this race, but I am going to be supporting. I will not be, it's on vacation, but just the same. If you're there and you see me, I'd love to see you and cheer for you. Um, it'll be exciting. Uh, cool to cheer you all on. I'll, we'll be soaked because it looks like some sort of a mini typhoon sort of a thing is coming in for a few days and it's just going to dump rain on everyone. So it should be real slick bring your mud tires. Brandon's bringing four casters on his bike. And then I'm bringing my wheels with Aspen's as spares, just in case it isn't that muddy. I have a whole thing figured out. So it's going to be cool. Uh, Chad, let's get into the deep dive. It's from James. <clears throat> Do you want me to read this one this week? Although yeah, you did a all... fantastic job of reading the last, <laughs> Thank <laughs> last you. week. About yeah, I, I had a little yeah. punctuated yeah, punctuations yeah. I wanted to make. So this, this one, no, it's all you, man. All me. Cool. James says so many of your episodes talk about the importance of strength training. And I fully agree as a 55 year old guy. I know that I need to up the time I spend doing moderate resistance training. So I'm pretty sure that strength training will add more to my overall quality of life when I'm 80 than riding. Well, that's a great 100%. assumption for him to make. 100%. Right? Yeah. There, he points out, he makes a lot of good points. Actually. I don't want to spoil it though. Cool. Cool. He says, I realize that for the elite level mm -hmm. riders whose lives revolve around riding, this isn't an issue but my life doesn't revolve around riding. This is resonating with a lot of us here, right? Mm. I just really want to beat my mates to the top of the climb and go fast. I think that my cycling lifestyle may be similar to many of your listeners. According to previous podcasts, if I do train a road workouts too close to strength training, then my mitochondria cells reverse uh, their bio neutron genome. Insert Chad speak here. I think he's just... <laughs> Nailed throwing it. in words exactly yeah. right yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk yeah. about the bio neutron genome today <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah <clears throat> science he says i don't have the time or desire to work out twice a day after a trainer road workout i'm too exhausted to do any type of strength training if i do the strength training first i can't complete the workout i need my two rest days i think so now i'm down to two days on the trainer and three days of strength training which seems like my ride training will suffer I've also thought about lowering my FTP quite a bit so that I can do both workouts back to back. There has got to be an answer to doing these close together and making moderate gains in both. You may have covered this exact question in a previous podcast, but I've listened to most of them several times and I still haven't come up with the, with the black and white answer to this question. This is a great point because he's talking about, um, well, actually I'm not even going to say it because I know you're going to say it and I would butcher it and I would sound like uh, the, the science words, buzzwords, things that he just inserted. So Chad, take it away. Where do you want to start with this? <laughs> yeah, so James, this is a, this is a really big topic. Uh, it kind of revolves around concurrent training, <clears throat> which we're going to talk about. And, and your question specifically is something I want to address in more detail than I could with the other things I want to cover that are going to set up a better answer to your primary question, which is how to, how to kind of make strength training and endurance training play nice. Mm -hmm. So next podcast, and I won't be here next week, but I'll be here the following week is going to be, we'll, we'll cover how you add strength training to an endurance training regimen and basically fatigue management when you do it, because that's, that's really what we're talking about here. So the objective today, going to kind of lay the groundwork for that. And, and I'm going to explain why I believe that we're not at the mercy of what's the, what's called the interference effect. Okay. So interference effects basically states that opposing stimuli, and then in our case, that's combining endurance training with strength training, something termed concurrent training. These stimuli negatively impact many of the sought after adaptations that endurance training and strength training can bring us. So if you think of exercise on a spectrum, we have endurance at one end and we have strength and hypertrophy at the other hypertrophy being bigger muscle fibers. So put it in another way, we kind of have substrate metabolism or how we metabolize fat and carbohydrate on one end and on the other central nervous system adaptation and muscle synthesis. Okay. So endurance training improves our ability to metabolize or break down fuel to create energy, whereas strength training actually improves our ability to generate force via the buildup of muscle tissue. So endurance training is a catabolic process. Strength training, especially on the hypertrophy side, is an anabolic process. And then when you think of strength training on the neural side, I still view it as anabolic because you look no further than the, 
physiologic phenomenon of neuroplasticity, where, where we actually form and reorganize neural connections. I mean, that's a form of building, right? It's definitely not breaking down. So <clears throat> when we train for opposite physiological goals, so we're simultaneously trying to improve catabolic and anabolic processes, we're trying to simultaneously improve endurance and strength, this leads to adaptive interference, aka the interference effect. So to put it really simply, endurance adaptations are harmed by strength training and vice versa. But never mind the vice versa, we're going to focus on the fact that we're worried about strength training influencing, negatively influencing our endurance adaptations. So the, the gist of this is that we, we can balance the conflicting training stimuli and not dilute the adaptive response we're specifically looking for. And concurrent training proponents believe that <clears throat> both forms of training are beneficial and that a balance can be struck, that we can increase our fatigue resistance and we can increase our muscle size and force producing capabilities and push the pedals harder, right? The assumption is that neither the endurance adaptation nor the strength training will ever be optimal. But the more I read, the more I learn, I believe that's an arguable assumption because the research around both concurrent training and the interference effect often falls short. And it does so in a number of ways. And that's the gist of what I want to cover here. I have about five different subtopics, some, some super succinct, some are going to, might feel a little bit bloated, but all of them are what, what I feel are fair criticisms of why we can't lean in too heavily into this whole interference effect idea, not to the point where it tells us what we can and cannot do in terms of combining strength training and endurance training. So Jack, the first- can I put this in really simple terms <clears throat> really quick, that mm -hmm. strength training, because of the processes that go on in your body when you strength train, that makes it so that you cannot get as effective of adaptations from your bike training and vice versa. That's the, Basically, that's yeah. the concept that doing yeah. one will hurt the other. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. These are, so they're, they're effectively conflicting messages. So we send one message. We want one specific set of adaptations, but then we send an almost opposite message and want adaptations associated with that opposite message. And there's interference mm -hmm. between the two sets of messages and their interpretations and hence the adaptations that we want to come with them. Awesome. Cool. Okay. So criticism number one has to do with mechanism and uh, talked about this a number of times and that it's a long road from what we see at the cellular and the molecular level to what's our end game performance improvement. Mm -hmm. So we can get, we can see improved performance, even in the face of this interference effect. I mean, that's the gist of my whole argument today. So an example is a study that looked at recreationally active women. Another study looked at professional soccer players. Another study looked at male and female military recruits. And in all cases, they used a combination of sprint intensity training. So high intensity interval training, <clears throat> and they combined it with strength training, which is uh, in this case, heavy strength training. So low volume, high intensity. And in all examples, they enhanced their overall performance in their relative fields. So in, in, in all three of these cases, pretty, pretty wide diversity in types of players, what they need to, to perform better. They all, they saw also improvement. So the takeaway is that an understanding underlying, an understanding underlying mechanism doesn't promise results. So, so, so it doesn't matter how well we can see into the details, how well we can look at the cells and the molecules and say, okay, the AMPK and mTOR and TORC1 do this to PGC one alpha, this is metabolic or uh, catabolic, this is anabolic. doesn't matter how well we understand that, how that translates to performance still isn't super clear cut. So I'm not saying we can write off and forget mechanism, but I am saying that just because we understand mechanism doesn't necessarily mean we understand the performance outcome. Yeah. Well said, Chad, because <clears throat> that's like a, <clears throat> that's a common pitfall that we fall into with everything with scientific I've research fallen into right? it so many times. Yeah. 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 Because the mechanisms seem really clear. Right. Uh, but like you said, there's so much filtering that gets in between you and then pushing your pedals faster. Well, and I think that, I mean, this is, this is the impetus behind why I wanted to revisit the interference effect, because the first time we explained this, I was completely deep into the mechanism. I was looking at the alphabet soup of all these things and all their interactions and what they mean for mitochondrial biogenesis and what they mean for strength adaptation that a lost sight of the fact that, yeah, this, this makes sense way down at the mechanistic level, but again, does it translate to performance. Mm, yep. Okay. So another criticism of a lot of the research surrounding, uh, concurrent training and the interference effect is training status. A, a lot of studies fail to consider the differences in their subjects training levels. And there's a lot of evidence of this, uh, that 
evidence that the introduction of endurance training into a strength training program, and I realize that's backwards from what we're talking about, but this is an example of how compromised lower body strength happens in trained, but not moderately trained or untrained individuals. So, and in the case of the trained individuals, it was actually less pronounced when they separated the sessions. And we always talk about how much we have to separate the sessions and we talk doing it the next day, do it at the end of the day. But in this case, they only separated by a couple of hours and they saw a decrease in the interference effect for highly trained or at least trained strength athletes. So that already tips us off to the fact that uh, maybe there's not too much to worry about. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right. Another study looked at high intensity interval training on the bike right after heavy strength training. And this was, this was looking at the effects of muscle strength and hypertrophy. <clears throat> Sorry, this is ridiculous. Okay. So in this study in particular, they, over the course of eight weeks, took untrained college males, had them work out a couple times a week, and they both saw similar increases in strength and hypertrophy. So they could move more weight and they had bigger muscle fibers. Yes, their rate of force development or their snap did decrease in the combination group, but on the other side of things, the capillary density and the aerobic capacity increased in the combination group. So the takeaway is that strength plus immediate high intensity interval training after led to significant increases in some of the areas that are relevant to endurance athletes, and it didn't inhibit the strength gains in the untrained young men. So again, training status is something that actually has to be looked at. And I think a lot of us maybe don't qualify as untrained, but probably most of us fall into the moderately trained group. <clears throat> now, when it comes to uh, concurrent training and untrained females specifically, a study looked at concurrent training with different aerobic exercises and uh, different intensities. And this was a, a decent, decent sample size. They had 44 young women physically active, but they hadn't done any structured training at least three months prior to this study. They separated into, into four groups where they did strength training, all they did the same, same strength training, but then some of them did run workouts. Some of them did bike workouts. Some of them were intervals. Some of them were continuous. So they really varied it quite a lot. Had them do it a couple times a week for 11 weeks and the concurrent training yielded similar neuromuscular adaptations. So that, that neural adaptation that leads to strength benefits over the strength alone group. And on top of it, they got increased endurance capacity. Now, more support that the higher training status can actually lead to greater interference effect was a very recent systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at strength development during concurrent training and once again, untrained, moderately trained, trained individuals. And this, I think 20, yeah, in fact, 27 studies actually met the inclusion criteria, <clears throat> 750 participants, and they confirmed that as athletes become more trained, con uh, concurrent training actually leads to smaller strength gains than just strength training. So strength, grain, strength gains are likely to be harder earned as our endurance of fitness ascends. And this is kind of a known thing, but what's not so known is that even in experienced strength athletes, there was no significant impact on strength gains if the sessions were separated by, in this case, just three hours. So no interference effect with just a little three hour gap in between workouts. And this actually carried the same session, chronic uh, concurrent training too. So, mm -hmm. so athletes, who did their endurance training and went directly to strength training 10, 15 minutes later or vice versa. No, uh, no evidence of the interference effect. So takeaway one is if you're untrained, forget the term interference effect. It doesn't apply to you. It's not something you need to concern yourselves with. Probably the same with moderately trained athletes, again, which is where a lot of us fall. Second takeaway is that when targeting strength gains, consider prioritizing your strength work. And we've talked about that a number of times. What's more important to you? Well, place emphasis on that. So this is interesting because if you're a strength athlete and let's say you're really going for lifting heavy things and that's your goal and you just want to supplement it on the bike, it seems like there's a greater chance at having possible interruption there. Like with having uh, your strength training be affected by adding more endurance training possibly. But when you go the other way, when you're talking about athletes that are prioritizing endurance training, the strength training doesn't mm -hmm. seem to come at the cost of it. Yeah. And, and I honestly wish it were that simple. It's not quite mm -hmm. that simple, but that, that, that does hold up for the most part. And, and most people don't need to dig any more deeply than that. Leave it to me to oversimplify. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 it's, it's, it's appreciated. Okay. So another criticism with the research surrounding these two things is, is training variables. And basically we're talking about the interplay of training volume, the load, the intensity, depending if it's on the bike and in the gym exercise selection. And that's something we're going to dive in more deeply on the next podcast, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, a study that I was 
found really enlightening was by five bishop and Steptoe back in 2014. And I liked it, especially because along with the, the words, all the hard words, they diagrammed the interference, interference effect concept. And if you link to it, if you want to look at it, it's figure two. And they showed that endurance training has effects on the strength training response. So if the intensity and or the volume of your endurance training is too high, it results in what, what, what you'd expect is residual fatigue, but that can lead to a decrease in force production, which is tied hand in hand with a decrease in type two fiber activation that can lead to a compromised strength training stimulus and a reduced anabolic response to strength training. Okay. Same thing goes with substrate depletion. So you do an endurance workout prior to your strength training and you go in with depleted glycogen stores that can lead to increased amino acid oxidation. So now you're burning muscle and now you're burning protein. This is, this is the fear we all, we, we've talked about a number of times that many people worry about probably too much. So, but, but you know, it's still, still a topic. And, and that leads to that same reduction in the anabolic response to strength training. So this, this same diagram by Fife and colleagues also addressed the proximity of exercise sessions and, and noted that if endurance training precedes strength training, both that uh, residual fatigue and that substrate depletion are, are in play during your strength training. Uh, and then if one session is in too close proximity, meaning you didn't gap it enough in order to the, in, in uh, relative to that other session, the endurance training session, same thing happens. Okay, along these lines, Another very recent study looked at the impact of low volume concurrent training on muscle adaptation. And this is especially interesting. They looked at 290 military conscripts, conscripts, totally randomized assignment. I mean, there was, there was just no rhyme or reason to it. You got plunked into one of these two groups and, and you worked out for nine weeks and you either did four by 15 minute strength sessions or plus four by 15 minute endurance sessions, or you simply did a one by 60 of each. And, and they were separated by at least two hours. And in no cases did you work out more than three sessions per day. So at the most, I guess, 60 minutes per day. Uh, they looked at a whole lot of measures of strength and endurance and physiologic adaptation. And what they found was it didn't really matter which protocol was followed. So I think this poses the question that if shorter and longer workouts yield similar results in so many ways, why do we care at all? And my answer is because fatigue. It's effects on consistency, it's effects on subsequent workout quality, it's effects on the quality of the workout you're in, especially when it comes to strength training. The idea of if you have four sets and you train to failure on that first set, how does that impact sets two, three, and four? And that's something we're going to, I'm going to elaborate on the next time we talk about this. So the point is, is that uh, one of the points I'm trying to make is that these variables are all aspects of the interference effect that are well within our control. So recognize it or not, all the stuff that happens at the mechanistic levels, we still have ways to influence how much this interference effect actually impacts our eventual outcome, our performance. Mm. <clears throat> okay, next criticism of some, not all, of the literature on these topics is the order of exercise sessions. And, and this, is, th this is a tough one. This is the one where I think we get a heck of a lot of questions. If I do my strength training first, if I follow it huh. after VO2 max work, if... Oh man, so many permutations. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lean on uh, one of my favorite researchers, Keith Barr, and his paper using molecular biology to maximize concurrent training and a few specific recommendations, because these, these seem to bear out across the literature. Uh, high intensity interval training, perform it first, give it a three hour gap. The idea being for the endurance signaling to, to return to baseline before you do your strength training, the signaling for which can last at least 18 hours post in that gap, fully refuel during, during, during that interim stretch. And this is backed up by a couple of studies probably cited in his paper where metabolic signaling responses to endurance training inhibit protein synthesis. So this is a anti-anabolic, so it doesn't have to be catabolic. It's just not promoting the anabolic side of things that it, that could be taking place, but these are relatively transient. Don't last as long compared with the anabolic signaling that follows strength training. So to put that simply, Endurance training signaling fades quickly, strength training fading, uh, signaling fades slowly. So would that um, imply that it may be better to do your endurance training first and strength training later if you were to fit it into a day? Is that what that's getting at there? It, that, that, it, yeah, yep, yeah, basically. I mean, there, there's no real optimal because there are other factors. If we could have things exactly the way we wanted, if our days were wide open and we could structure our workouts based on no other commitments or mm -hmm. obligations, Yep, probably. Interesting. But even then, probably not, not definitely. Yeah. Okay. Another, another of his recommendations is strength training later in the day, 
followed by protein ingestion. And this just makes sense. He, he got specific and said leucine rich protein ingestion. And then he said again, prior to bed. So this does assume that we're trying to build muscle mass, but I mean, if you're engaging in strength training, whether you want to or not, a little bit of muscle mass is going to creep into the picture. doesn't mean you're going to bulk up. doesn't mean you're going to kill your strength to weight ratio, but bigger muscles can do more work, can, can create more force. Another recommendation of his was that performing strength training after low intensity training actually accentuates the endurance adaptation. So when I say low intensity training, basically talking about endurance work. So riding around 60, 65% threshold, and it actually accentuates this endurance adaptation more than just doing that low intensity training alone. And the low intensity training won't actually impact the strength training signaling. So an aerobic endurance ride followed by strength training actually yields can yield has shown evidence of better endurance adaptations. This so, is like, I know there's no room for anecdote here, but I'm going to oh, throw one in just, just the Why same because <laughs> we're dealing with studies of like much larger scale, but I don't know if you've noticed this Ivy, but when I am keeping up on my strength training and I'm being very diligent with it, in addition to that, I am absolute, I feel like I am faster on the bike. That doesn't mean that I can press harder on the pedals. That doesn't mean, and my assumption is always this is that it's that it, the strength training in some way is actually helping magnify or helping increase those adaptations that I'm getting from the endurance training. Uh, have you noticed that too, though, like where they go hand in hand and you have like a compound effect? Yeah. And I feel like every, I, I'm not sure how to describe it, I guess it's, it's hard to quantify, right. But feeling mm -hmm. like you have a strong trunk and a strong core and that you're more comprehensively solid makes the effort on the bike feel less leg heavy. It's hard to describe, but I, I agree with you. And okay. especially with off-road disciplines too. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely want to refute this. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if James was implying that, you know, people that are just revolving around riding, they, they don't do as much weight training or that it's not a problem for them, but like even all the elite cyclocross athletes that I've traveled with this year, everyone's doing stuff off the bike between races every weekday. It's totally part of our routine. No, Ivy, I, I took more... issue with that, that sentiment as well. I, th I think James <laughs> just doesn't understand that even at the elite level strength training, and, and then I don't really like the term resistance training simply because even pedaling the bike is a form of resistance training. So I'd like to lean more towards strength training, but Strength training comes in a lot of different forms and it can be entirely body weight. It can be entirely isometric and, and they carry benefits and pro level, high level, world level athletes still do some form of it. And then some of them do quite a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. All right, Chad, sorry for my anecdotal interruption here. Nope. Um, jump in, jump in. It's, it's uh, cool. quite a lot of info. Okay, so the, the least interference consensus seems to be that separating your endurance training from your strength training by at least a day, so 24 hours between training simulations is, is optimal, but researchers commonly recognize time constraints. It's just the way it is. So I want, want to tell you not to worry, and, and one of the reasons why I say that is because of a, well, just more evidence, a 2017 systematic review and meta-analysis on concurrent strength and endurance training sequence. So this was a review of literature up through 2016, noted that endurance training before strength training versus the other way around. So, so, and then you use lower body one RM strength and VO2 max. So they were measuring strength with, you know, how much you can, I think squat one time max and your, your actual VO2 max and the inclusion criteria for this review was greater than eight weeks of training. They used males and females, teens and seniors trained and untrained, and they separated the training modes by five to 10 minutes. So we're basically talking same session workouts. And they found that one RM or so your max strength was higher when strength training came first, but there was no change in VO2 max regardless of the session order. So the takeaway being is that training order for endurance athletes who are concerned with VO2 max may not really matter. Hmm. Interesting. Cause that's, that hits at one of like the main questions, right? Is that mm -hmm. where do Common I stack question. them in my day? Huh. Honestly, I think most of this is just, we, we, we think too much about it because fortunately, unfortunately we understand mechanism and, and it messes with us. Yeah. Okay. It's so like another this overthinking things. That's a shock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a cerebral sport. Yeah, it is. 
Uh, okay, so another criticism is uh, how fatigue is treated. So endurance training, sadly, is often just overlaid with the addition of strength training. That, that's how it is. It's not, I'm going to add strength training to it, so I'm going to cut back on my endurance training in such and such ways. Rather, it's just, oh, I'm going to pile this on top, see how things go. Hmm. So we, we kind of covered residual fatigue up top, but, but what about fatigue due to this increase in training load? So a paper by Coffey and... And John Hawley, it was a review 2016 asking, do these opposites attract? And I want to quote them. It's possible that acute residual fatigue from a previous exercise session and or chronic fatigue due to undertaking a greater total workload to match adaptive responses of single mode training are generating the interference effect. So simply we're, we're outpacing our adaptive resources. It's too much stress. It's too much fatigue. We can't accommodate it. Yep. It's common. And we hear athletes all the time say, I added strength training. And now that I've added strength training, it's hard to, you know, I don't feel like I'm improving quite as much at the same rate. That's typical what we hear for the first week, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Um, because like you said, Chad, they're keeping everything the same and they may have been operating it. Uh, even if they had more time, they could have added on more stress to what they were doing before. The fact is they have now added on more stress and but we like to compartmentalize it and keep everything in such a vacuum where we're like, no, this is my bike stress. So <laughs> it should be fine. And I should not feel any different than all of the other forms of stress that I'm bringing into my life, which this one in terms of strength training is quite literal and, and very direct and comparable to what we're doing in that mm -hmm. regard. Well, as endurance but, athletes, I mean, we're juggling a lot of balls. So we're trying to do quite a lot of training. And if you're a multi-sport athlete, quite a lot of different forms of training. And then we just layer the strength training on top. And it's understandable. You know, you want to include this too, but you in some cases, maybe you can accommodate that additional stress, but I think in too many cases, it's just, it's, it's just that little bit, that straw that breaks the camel's back that it's it just, you have to figure out somewhere else that you're going to tone things down such that you can accommodate this. And, and that, that would be my advice on this matter for any athlete I were coaching is to tone it back, you know, cut out one workout, add your two 30 minute strength training sessions. And then you can bring that workout back later. If you understand, if you see evidence of the fact that you're accommodating this new increase in a different type of stress too. Mm -hmm. So not only is it more stress, but it's a type of stress your body's probably not at all accustomed to. Mm -hmm. I'm laughing because even, uh, even just core is like the easiest thing to want to cut out when I'm <laughs> really tired <laughs> yeah. instead of laying down oh, yeah. on the floor, flopping around. It, it's, you know, <laughs> of the proprietary. <laughs> I'm not sure to call it core training, but I get, yeah. I get your, yeah, I get it's your totally true. Yeah. Of the things <laughs> to cut around. out between training and, and work and preparing food for myself and sleeping, it's the easiest thing to want to. But that's a uh, super good point. Even core training. You think I'm just going to do a little bit of core training at the end of the day because core training is easy. Well, it's not. And it's, not. it's really not. Not <laughs> if you want it to be effective, especially. Yeah. So it is yet another form of stress that you're piling on top of it. And if you're dead tired, even just rolling over on the floor to do a plank for a minute at a time, that's this more work. That's, that's the yeah, body that could be more. convalescing that is now asked to do a, a total body muscle contraction. <laughs> there've been multiple times where I've like laid down with the intent of doing core work or something else, whether I have the foam roller or something else, I just find myself flipping the foam roller in my hands. <laughs> 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 I'm just like, I'm not doing this right now. You yeah. know? Yeah. I'm sure we've all done that. Hopefully that's relatable for more than just me right now. <laughs> so yeah. What's okay. Next, and then probably my favorite topic of late is, is nutrition and how it impacts all these things that shame, shamefully, I have to admit, I didn't look as hard at as I should have in, in years past. So nutrition is typically poorly addressed and often overlooked entirely in so many of these studies. So my question is, could the interference effect be less about competing signals and more about insufficient nutrition? I do think it's a question worth asking, even if there's nothing there. So if, if really this is a matter of endurance versus strength, which is really a matter of catabolic versus anabolic, which is really a matter of substrate metabolism versus protein synthesis, then it's kind of a matter of carbohydrate and fat versus protein intake. If we want to look at it from a nutritional perspective. So if we go back to that five paper, the one with the diagram, they talk about substrate, substrate depletion. So carbohydrate and fat depletion leads to a decrease in the anabolic response. And this translates to both an increase in protein breakdown and a decrease in protein synthesis. But what if you nourish properly? This may be the question. It's a question that doesn't get asked often enough. 
too many of the concurrent training interference effects studies neglect to address nutrition. And one example is a, a study that looked at concurrent exercise and muscle protein synthesis. And yes, for space crews, I get it, but I'll allow it. And here's why. Mm -hmm. Strength training following, in this case, 90 minutes of strenuous aerobic cycling led to suppressed protein synthesis. There was no mention of additional nutrition in this post 90 minute pre-ride, post this 90 minute pre-ride, which was also followed <clears throat> with 30 minutes of rest. So basically by all indications, these athletes went two hours without any sugar. Only mentions of nutrition in this entire study were first the ensure plus dinner that they had the night before, which was 50% of their daily caloric intake in the form of those God awful little meal replacement shakes. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> they, Science they conceded. <laughs> this is the bummer of a meal. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, they did concede that the poor nutritional status of astronauts in orbit may contribute to the ineffectiveness of the exercise countermeasures. Mm. Probably. <laughs> okay. So, so how about fasted training? It's a pretty buzzy topic, but fasted training we have to recognize has very specific targeted outcomes, but even still, whenever you read about fasted training, it's usually accompanied with warnings talking about don't overdo it. Ideally employed in moderation, only in appropriate scenarios with respect to duration and intensity. So the point is even when insufficient nutrition is the intention, nutritional intake is still of keen importance. Also nutrition is yet another variable within our control. So I ask, why wouldn't all studies around concurrent training interference effect closely track nutrition? And th th there's a lot to be gained there, but do it for no other reason than to rule this out as an influence on their findings. I think I know why Chad it's hard. Like when in, in, if you're dealing with so many study subjects, like some of these, you know, with like 290 with those military conscripts and, and things like that. Yeah. That's understandable. Getting, everybody to eat. I mean, even when you're dealing with a few people to get them to eat the same thing. And then also who's to say that those people will react similarly to the same exact dietary restriction, right? It's, I, I, yeah, it's so complex. I couldn't agree more. I think that's yeah. a very solid point, but yeah. it, it doesn't remove the fact or it doesn't obliviate the fact that this is still something hugely important to consider in, in just about any study surrounding exercise. We have to know how the, the, the participants were nourished. Agreed. It's, it's kind of like a drawback of the clinical study model, right? And this it's, it's just complicated to do that. And the answer to usually weeding out and getting rid of a lot of those variables is to have more study subjects. So then you can average things out, but then it just gets even more complex to control mm -hmm. that. So, but, but like you said, even though it's very difficult, that still doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done because what we put into our bodies is absolutely what we get out in terms of performance. So to ignore that is, yeah, it's, it should, it's it should at least be included in the study design, you know, whether or not they're super happy with how well they did it and how honest their participants were and how well they followed the dietary recommendations. It should at least be part of it. And, and maybe it probably is. If I paid attention to old studies versus newer studies, I'm sure it's, it's better represented mm -hmm. these days than then. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on a related note, um, and these are two interesting points to kind of, uh, conflict with one another, but caloric restriction induces anabolic resistance to strength training. So basically if you're starving yourself, don't expect big strength or hypertrophy gains. Okay. That, that in and of itself, that's obvious. If we're not furnishing enough protein. We're doing a bunch of strength training and our muscles don't get bigger. That's, that's shouldn't be surprising to anybody, but then camera and colleagues in 2012 demonstrated that low glycogen doesn't necessarily suppress anabolic response to strength, strength training. So kind of the other same, other side of things. And there's a reason I brought this up and I'll get to it. They looked at 16 physically fit males. They had, uh, so, so their histories where they trained at least three times a week, concurrent training for more than a year. They all had VO2 maxes roughly in the 50 ballpark. So they weren't deconditioned. They weren't highly conditioned somewhere in between moderately trained as, as I refer to it. Um, they did one leg where they depleted it of glycogen. The, uh, they did uh, 10 minutes, a couple of minute breaks at 75% of their two leg VO2 max. So that's tough. I mean, they calculated VO2 max with two legs and then they had one leg do that work or 75% of that work until basically they cooked it. They depleted it of glycogen and then they had both legs do eight times five unilateral leg press. So one leg leg presses at about 80% of one RM. So this is pretty hard work and it's quite a lot of work. So the takeaway is that in the event that you perform muscle endurance work, so say you do threshold repeats over unders, 
sweet spot work and you can eat before your strength training, the anabolic signaling may not suffer as much as you think as a result of, and let's say occasional glycogen storage. I'm not saying this is something you should do on a routine basis, but if it happens, don't sweat it. You may still actually get something out of your strength training. And this is, this provides us with an example of high metabolic endurance training followed by high volume strength training and how the two can still play nice, at least in the short term. And the key to differentiate Chad's talking about the fact that if you don't have all that glycogen on supply, full you know, bottles filled, so to speak in that regard with strength training, it will not be as harmed as much. However, endurance yeah, so, training is a different deal. Exactly. So, yeah. so if at the end of the day, you've done your endurance training earlier, you ran yourself down you realize, man, I haven't replaced all that glycogen. This is going to be a terrible strength training workout. I'm probably not even going to, it isn't even worthwhile. I'm not going to get the anabolic signaling that I'm after. Well, this study says maybe not. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And then a, a study a few years back by Wong and uh, colleagues demonstrated that the addition of strength training can actually enhance mitochondrial biogenesis, which is something we chase with endurance training, but this is being yielded by the strength training side of things. So they, for, they had athletes or participants do an hour. It's about 65% of VO2 max. So we're talking about in the ballpark of 80% of your FTP. They rested for 15 minutes and then they did six sets of leg press at about 70 to 80% of their one rep max. So, so reasonably high intensity as many as possible or 15, whichever came first, but either way, fair amount of work. And contrary to their expectations, the strength training following the endurance training amplified this mitochondrial biogenesis, biogenic signaling compared to the endurance training alone. So they actually mm -hmm. got better endurance adaptation, or at least, you know, more mitochondrial proliferation or signaling to it than if they just did their endurance training. So the takeaway being is that one hour of moderate intensity cycling closely followed by pretty strenuous lower body strength training actually increased endurance adaptation, providing us with an example of moderate intensity cycling on the bike. And then high, with the addition of high volume, lower body strength work, and it didn't negatively impact endurance goals. I mean, Ivy and I could have saved them a whole lot of time and just told them that, but you know, that's <laughs> we're just, we're just psyched to hear it back by science. So we can that's right. go do yeah. mad deadlifts for, for days and, and, and feel good about it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay. Sorry, so, Chad. so finally, I want to look at the landmark study that actually inspired this entire avenue of research. So we got to go back to 1980 where Hickson, uh, Robert, Robert Hickson, uh, basically looked at the interference of strength development by simultaneously training for strength and endurance. It's the title of the study. It's linked and some subsequent criticisms. And these aren't, aren't, aren't even mine, but I, I agree with all of them. And I, I've punctuated it with little uh, bits of my own editorialization. So first, Hickson's moderately trained athletes would not meet today's standards for moderately trained. Uh, and I quote, several of the subjects were active in recreational sports, but none had been training on a regular basis for at least three months prior to the start of the exercise program. That to me says untrained, maybe not completely deconditioned, never trained, but that's untrained. That's the three month gap. Mm -hmm. Then let's look at the protocols themselves. And this is fascinating. And for a number of reasons that, that we'll talk about first, the endurance protocol six days a week for 10 weeks, they had to do six by five VO2 max intervals on, on three of those days. On the other three days, 40 minutes of, of running as fast as they can. So basically high end VO2 max work on the bike or low end VO2 max work on the run, but they were just flogging themselves six days a week for 10 weeks in a row on the strength side, only five days a week for the same 10 weeks. And it was all about legs five by five of squats, three by five of knee flexion and extension, three by five of leg press, three by 20 calf raises. And these were divvied up on different days, but five days of this. And it was all done with as much weight as possible, which suggests to me training to failure, which again, we're going to talk about next week. So, you know, and then the third protocol, which was endurance plus strength. And it was just these together, just combine them, just, just do it all. Which, so the subjects died? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so, so the, the combination one is just more work, plain and simple. They didn't volume match it, okay? They didn't tone anything down to, to make it the same volume across groups. These poor SOBs just had to do all of it. So these these are all Science massive. Is sad. <laughs> in this case, it is. Back in the yeah. 80s, it was. So these are all massive doses of training for any athlete, let alone untrained athletes. So the, the another criticism not mine, is that the endurance group sought 
on the order of two and a half times the amount of endurance training that has been used in subsequent similar studies. So no one has taken things to this extreme since. And it sounds like I'm, I'm ripping on Hickson here, but we all have the benefit of hindsight. He was a, a frontiersman. He, he was, this is his first time laying it out there. Here's my theory. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to beat him up real bad and see how these two things in, intertwine. So can't fault him at all. Can fault the athletes who stuck it out for 10 weeks though. I, I hope they were paid well. <laughs> okay. So lastly, fatigue, nutrition, sleep, hydration, recovery. None of those things were described, which just leaves us to wonder. So again, my takeaway is not a critique of this landmark first time study, but rather a criticism of anyone who leans into this study without considering or knowing the details. Okay. So put another way, if this is your basis for argument, it's perhaps not the strongest support for the interference effect. Hmm. Okay. And in closing, I'm just going to read you my three overall takeaways. First, the interference effect simply doesn't have enough unequivocal support to deter any athlete from combining strength training and endurance training. Be clear on that. Secondly, at least in my opinion, secondly, unless you're at the elite level, there's almost certainly more to be gained from concurrent training, or I'm sorry, strength training plus endurance training than endurance training alone, regardless of workout order, intensity, duration, proximity to other workouts, combination of workouts, et cetera. Don't get hung up on the details, do them both. They're both beneficial. And then thirdly, adaptation has to be nourished, even in fasted training, which may inspire signaling that can lead to adaptations. The downstream adaptations themselves have to be nourished. Those are really good, uh, good takeaways for athletes to be able to apply. And like, these are things that I should do with strength training and keep in mind moving forward. Now, now I hope I, to get a little more specific. And mm -hmm. so not next week, but the week after I'm still trying to, to, to put it all together. Cause this is, this is literally half of the research I came up with on this topic, which is why it got divided into two, two podcasts. <laughs> so I, I got to trim that down such that I, we can have some very actionable takeaways so that people aren't still left wondering, well, what does that mean? What, what do I do next time I go to the gym? So give me, give me a couple of weeks and we'll see what I can put together. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Chad. Uh, it's great insight into that. And I'm glad to know that Ivy and I are scientific. So uh, <laughs> let's get some rapid fire. Matt says, I've been using Trainer Road now for the past couple of years across the winter months. I'm now looking to use it year round heading into the 2022 and 2023 season. The problem I have is that I am coming into this winter of 21, having not trained for several weeks. Long story short, I'm the unfittest I have been heading into the winter Trainer Road training season. It sounds like just an off season uh, in this case, Matt. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, he says, the question I have is, should I select some random workouts to get back up to speed prior to a ramp test? Or should I just crack and crack and live with the, uh, and he says in quotes, disappointing starting or base point. Any suggestions are welcome. Uh, love Trin road. Thanks from Matt Ivy. Uh, what would you say? Okay. Well, all of our athletes train so much more and so much harder than I would ever if taking <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks off is a detriment and makes you feel like you're the unfittest you've ever been. That's crazy to me. This is totally a normal off season. It's totally okay to take a few weeks off and yeah. Also and it's necessary. Starting, right? It's totally necessary. And starting from that base point and feeling like you have a lot of ground to make up and something to work towards is exciting for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't be sad, Matt. Just get, get into it, bud. <laughs> yeah. And I, I would say, yeah, just do the ramp test because you're going to have a better calibration. So basically like what you're asking for here is, should I noodle around before or for a little bit before I get to training or should I just start training? And, and the fact is training isn't, um, prior to adaptive training, I think that hopefully we can shift this narrative with adaptive training, but prior to that, a lot of athletes would keep their FTP where it, where it was, or keep whatever benchmark they used for their training, where it was from the previous season or from where they were during the meat of the season, perhaps not the peak of the season. So that's why it felt like it was hard when you came back to training is because you were <laughs> training too hard in the beginning, but now just take that ramp test and then your levels are going to adjust. And then you're going to have workouts that are going to be appropriate for you. And Matt, you are going to be so enthused with this. First of all, acknowledge, like Ivy said, that there is an ebb and flow to every season, but you're going to be so enthused because you're going to see your levels going up every single workout. It's going to be awesome. So don't worry about it. Take off this, seasons. This reminds me of back when I taught bike classes, I would get a lot of people who expressed interest in taking the bike classes, but didn't want to join them until they had a base level of fitness so that they mm -hmm. could 
join. <laughs> and it's the training same idea. Training. That tra exactly. Yeah. Training for training. They feel like they had to train in order to be ready to train. And that's, that's just not, that may be the way it works in some scenarios, but when we're assessing fitness and giving you a starting basis, we, you don't need to train for that. You just come in, we see where your fitness is and we, we, we move from there. So I do understand that reassessing and seeing your threshold or your FTP has fallen is a bitter pill to swallow, but it's temporary. Just, just trust the process. Know that your body needs that break. Some fitness may slip away, but you'll get it all back. Absolutely. Uh, Rachel, some more rapid fire from what she sent to us last week that we didn't get to. Uh, this was round two from last <clears throat> week. And she says, ready, go celebrity crush as a teenager. Hmm. Should we do this in order? Like everyone? Yeah. 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 Go uh, ahead. You go first. <laughs> I'll go first. Okay. I'll go first. I'll go first. Give Ivy more time to think. Yeah. So he Heather Lockler or Heather Thomas, which, which probably means nothing to anybody unless they're pushing 50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't need time to think my celebrity crush as a teenager is the same as an adult. I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, yeah, with my time frame, Britney Spears was the, the hottest thing on earth when we were kids, uh, teenagers, mm. I guess you could say. So this dates us very well. Maybe that's what Rachel's going for here is trying to figure <laughs> out her exact age to the date because she probably just got it. Uh, cake or pie. I honestly can't choose. I just can't. Ooh. I don't discriminate. <laughs> good for you chad <laughs> good I'm, for very, you. I'm very woke when it comes to cake or pie. <laughs> ivy how about you pie pie all day yeah yeah like oh yeah banana, banana cream pie oh my gosh we all just had a uh, pecan i'm gonna say it pecan is how i say it pecan yeah. pie over the weekend that was <laughs> <laughs> chill <laughs> she's amazing oh yeah pie for sure <laughs> How fast have you driven in a car? Upwards of 130 miles an hour. I don't know because I had to stomp on the brakes so hard. I, I, I'm checking the speedometer, looking at the road, checking the speedometer, looking at the road. What do I see? But a police car coming up over the horizon. So but for what it's worth though, ceramic brakes on 20 inch wheels are astounding. I, mean, I dropped 60 miles per hour in no time. I didn't get a ticket by the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ivy? I'm a conservative, <laughs> vehicular driver. I don't know. Maybe you broke 90? 100? I don't think so, actually. Oh, no, for sure I did because I had a really old Subaru that I was curious if it could. So I, I tried. It did. <laughs> found, a, found a long it hill. Found a hill. <laughs> it, it, it didn't last my fucking <laughs> <laughs> Tailwind day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I um, in a car, I don't know uh, probably over 130. um, motorcycle, different story. So, hmm. and I think statute of limitations is passed. So 167, uh, that's when it topped out and it was that's governed crazy. at that point. So, uh, okay. When people stand, uh, stand up for a standing ovation are usually the one earlier or one of the earlier people to stand up or one of the later people. <laughs> this is like, a, this is a good dating question to ask, <laughs> you know, that's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Two different types try, of people. I try to avoid crowds and hence standing ovations. So <laughs> I, I don't do either. Yeah. This question assumes that I'm the kind of person that goes to like plays and operas instead of like basement punk shows. So I don't know. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be starting the slow clap at the basement punk show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that would be hilarious. Uh, yeah. I, I'm uh, one of the latter. I don't like to start it. <clears throat> Darker milk chocolate. Oh, dare you. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> How dare this question exist, right, Chad? Yeah. Why yeah, is yeah. milk chocolate? Why? Yeah. Why does it even exist? Dark. I like milk okay. chocolate. Sorry, guys. Oh, my oh, goodness. That's why. You're why. <laughs> 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 I, I, everyone, the first time, or when I went to Switzerland, I was like, oh, Swiss chocolate. I can't wait to try it. And Swiss people, please tell me that the chocolate is better than all of the various kinds of milk chocolate that you be. had. Because that milk chocolate was not very good. So, uh, okay. The most, okay. The song fill in the blank. The song Africa by Toto is indecipherable and yet somehow powerful. I've never made sense of that song, but it moves <laughs> me every time I hear it. <laughs> All yeah, right. An absolute masterpiece. Oh, regrettable is what I would say. <laughs> it's, it's existence is regrettable to me. I, 
that one is nails on a chalkboard. Jessica, I remember hearing on a previous episode that Chad is a big movie TV show buff. What movies or shows have you been enjoying lately on the trainer lately, Chad? Okay, since I'm not particularly good with brevity, I <laughs> use my top four networks. I'm going to start with Apple TV. I'll be quick. <laughs> Invasion. If you haven't watched that, it's it's enthralling. It's so good. The morning show is always just interesting. I, I can just put that on anytime. Hulu, dope sick about the opioid crisis. Tremendously illuminating and just really well done. And then what we do in the shadows. And if you're not in the know in terms of Taika Waititi, you, you need to be because the man is brilliant. He's behind so many good things. And Jim Inclement, of course. Netflix, uh, Narco season three, which is Mexico and Hellbound. And these are both readers. So if you're okay with subtitles, I prefer subtitles on the bike when it comes to long workouts, because the time just seems to pass better when I'm reading something. And Midnight Mass, that's absolutely worthwhile. HBO Max, my probably my favorite thing going right now is Succession. I live for it on a weekly basis. And of course, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is in like its 10th season and still just doesn't have a weak episode. And then my current fascination, which I just stumbled across last night, was on Hulu. It's called Normal People. Nice. I, I don't have anything to add here. I am so not a TV person. Ivy, you? No, uh, I, I have a hard time watching TV or movies on the trainer too, because then I just like stop pedaling and I just want to watch TV. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'll like flick through like a few minutes of TikToks waiting to hear for the normal <laughs> sound of buzz. I'm like, ah! and, and, and then... <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird thing because I used to have to have very specific music in, in order to work out hard. And now all all my workouts 100 percent, are done watching tv hmm. i'm impressed <clears throat> wow yeah yeah i actually took a picture the other day i got this instagram ad for this thing that goes over a bathtub i don't know it was weird it was like a thing that you like put over it and then it can hold like your phone or your ipad a drink like all these things and they had this scene laid out with this bathtub and it was like impressive there was a book over here there was a screen over here there were candles there was drinks wow. everything and i was like hey it's coach chad <laughs> that's how you train <laughs> okay yeah me on the bike not in the bath we're really just not allowed to be alone with our own thoughts ever <laughs> I know, right? bring your entire life with you to the bath <laughs> yeah okay bennett says recently started trainer road and i'm loving it We'll be staying in Florida for the winter where there is ample opportunity for outdoor riding. How do I continue my structured trainer road training? I probably could bring my kicker, but still, how would I then use trainer road to guide my train or guide my riding? Uh, yeah. So outside workouts. And if you don't have a power meter, you can use the, there's a little switch and instead of power based, you can go to RPE based, makes it super easy, but yeah, you're going to love them. And Florida, I have a, my good friend, Dylan lives in Florida. It's awesome for structured workouts because it's consistent and that's what you really want. Um, depending on where you're at, if you're up in the Northern part of Florida, it tends to be a bit more rolly and stuff, but yeah, it's consistent. So it's fantastic spot for outdoor training. And then if you are going to be training inside, get yourself a fan and, uh, some sort of an air conditioner. Um, it's not very, not very cool there. Okay. Dylan recently switched to our carb and he says hyperloading. He mentions that he's been using Martin 320. And I've had great results using only high carb drink mix for up to three hour rides. I haven't tried this strategy on longer rides. How far should one go on just one or on just drink mix or at a certain point, should you change strategy to a lower carb, higher calorie food and just eat more and try to maintain 80 to hundred grams of carbs per hour. So first of all, lower carb, higher calorie food implies that you would be having higher fat content or protein content, likely fat content, um, which if your body is trying to metabolize things and operate and you've got like everything running, fat's just going to slow things down. Um, so like, if you look at things very objectively, it's not going to speed up digestion or help it in any way. So, uh, the answer Dylan to this one is there is no limit technically. I mean, it's really, if you can continue to be able to take it in and, uh, you get over things like palate fatigue and everything else like that, then you can keep doing it. Uh, I know it doesn't sound very appealing, but what's way less appealing is slowing down and feeling like you're going to bonk uh, after those three hours. Whereas having energy to the end of the ride and then continuing on and not being just fully dead thereafter, after that ride, that's what you really want to go for. So yeah, I would still fuel efficiently. I would still concern myself with intaking the same 80 to hundred grams per hour, if that's what seems to work for you, Dylan. But my concern would be around hydration. If you're, if you're drinking all your calories and you're doing it in such a uh, carbohydrate dense manner, 
Okay. Especially if you're sweating, I think at some point you might come up, up against dehydration issues. And even if it's, even if you're not sweating, there's still in, insensible water loss, things that you don't notice it ways that your body is losing some of its body water that will creep into the mix, especially three, four, five hours into a long day. Yeah. That's why I think that pairing this like gels and mix. So then you can always make sure that you're drinking enough of your mix, allow yourself mix your, uh, the, the, dilute your mix to a degree that you can drink more than a bottle an hour. If you need to, depending on your size and your sweat rate and everything else, like I being smaller and then also not sweating as much as somebody like Nate, who we've mentioned on the podcast sweats a lot. And he's a very tall person. So as a result, he's got a whole lot of surface area that his body's trying to shed that water on. He needs to drink more than 500 milliliters an hour. Right. Uh, that's, that's just how it goes. So you have to keep that in mind. Like what Chad said is absolutely real. So, and it's a shame too, because if you're to the point where you're like, okay, well, I'm already at 120 grams an hour, but I'm getting dehydrated. So I guess I just need to drink more of that mix. And then you make your gut get upset because you're not used to taking in that all because you're trying to avoid dehydration. That's why it's a little complex. You have to think about it. So I'm once again, a bell curve dweller. So it's super easy for me to just kind of do the status quo and be okay with it. But, but yeah. Good point. So just Chad. to clarify those super high carb drink mixes, people maybe don't hydrate in the same way because otherwise you're just intaking more carbs and is, yep. is that correct? Yeah. I think unless, saying? unless you have a hydration pack or only one of your bottles is drink mix and the other bottle is water. I think it's going to be hard for you to get enough water in addition to because I mean, the hydration typically aims for what? It's like four to six, maybe 8% carbohydrate per, mm -hmm. uh, per volume. And those drink mixes are way, way, way above that. So that's a whole lot of nutrients into the gut. That's going to pull water into the gut. That's going to pull water away from the skin. That's, I mean, just all the, all the dehydration complications come right along with that. Yeah. And there's like a, the isotonic, uh, level of a, of a gel or a drink mix or anything else that you're taking in that should minimize the amount of water you have to take in to process that effectively and that your body would shunt and pull away and pull into the gut to be able to process it. So with things like Martin, with things like SIS and their beta fuel stuff, you're dealing with isotonics. So you don't have to lose quite as much. The real problem I think with dehydration in this comes from the fact that, um, some people may sweat more than a standard bottle an hour sort of rate, depending on the ambient conditions and them as an athlete in person. So in that case, if you're just relying on bottles alone to get in your calories, then you don't, you can't take in extra, right? You might be already bumping up against the stops in terms of what your gut can tolerate. So then you necessarily dehydrate yourself. But one thing to keep in mind is if you Martin and, uh, SIS, not as much with their beta fuel, but I believe, but Martin has sodium in there a decent amount. Um, and then I like for Cape Epic, what I did is I had precision hydration, little capsules. And those I think are 250 milligrams. I popped one of those every single hour on the bike. Sometimes I popped extra. If it was like really hot, I would take two. Um, and then I was already getting sodium through my Martin and then some days I would mix my Martin a bit more diluted. And then I would know that I would need to take in more gels. Um, but in most cases, I just have my bottle and my gel and that got me to around 120 grams an hour. And I just checked those boxes off. I was never taking in less than a bottle an hour. So that's kind of how, but it gets tricky when you do both at the same time. And if you're a really heavy sweater, so you have to think about how you want to balance that out. Um, maybe you mix it more diluted. So but yeah, for back to Dylan's question though, if it's over three hour rides, if there's no magic drop-off point, um, where people say, oh, at this point you can't do that. You need real food. People say that because of palate fatigue. That's why they really say it. Um, also because of like feeling satiated, uh, but I would argue that that also, if you're fueling properly and you're just working and on the bike and everything else, you don't feel tired or you don't feel hungry when you're feeling at 80 to 120 grams an hour, um, depending on, on who you are. So, so yeah, anywho, uh, some listener questions that we have here. Uh, Sam says, Hey guys, loving the podcast and the adaptive training. Good to hear you can give it a shot, go to trainerroad.com and sign up, uh, give it a try. We have a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't like adaptive training after that point, we're happy to give you your money back. 
Oh, we think you'll like it. Uh, Sam says, I'm curious to know which training plan is best suited to targeting steep two to 20 minute KOMs. That's a huge range, Chad, <laughs> two <laughs> to 20 minutes. Uh, it says, so basically almost every KOM. He says, yeah, also keeping in mind two to three hours of endurance for getting out and back to the climb. I'm three quarters of the way through an eight week mid volume peer, uh, polarized training plan, which has been good. However, there's been no anaerobic or sprint work incorporated. I'm thinking I need a training plan that will focus on maximizing VO2. Um, so let's talk about the polarized plans first, and then we're going to talk about the KOM stuff. Um, so for, you mentioned that, uh, you had your, in the eight week mid volume polarized plan, which that is, that replaces build plans that we have in, in our training plan system. So, and he says that there's been no anaerobic work or sprint work, and that's intentional because that's typically race specific stuff that you find in specialty plans, not in the build phase. Right. So, uh, that's why it hasn't been included in there. Um, but that said, uh, you can always in substitute workouts if you'd like that you have for whatever unique needs that you have. Just keep in mind, if you just start to throw in anaerobic work in lieu of putting in work that's more focused on VO2 max work, which if you've been following that build plan, you absolutely have been doing VO2 max work. That's it just, um, VO2 max sometimes looks like five minutes long, looks like four minutes long, looks like three minutes long, and it looks like 105% and up from there, uh, not too high. So VO2 isn't crazy high. It's just painful. So, uh, that's kind of the, the rule of thumb there. Uh, okay. But I want to mention something with the polarized specialty plans. So first of all, it is of interest to us, but we want to get more data and feedback before diving into the specialty plans, because what we're looking for right now with the polarized plans is how people are using them, what workouts they're skipping, what workouts they're substituting, what sort of improvements they're getting in their different levels. Uh, if it's showing that it's a great handoff to their events and if they're showing greater increases or less increases than other modes. So then that way we can tweak those plans and adjust because right now we've done something that's super by the book where we're trying to stick to an 80, 20, as close as possible. Adaptive training will throw you out of that 80, 20 to a certain, uh, uh, to a certain degree, but not wildly. Um, but 80, 20 is the intention it's designed as that. And that's talking time and zone. We know that there's other opinions that it's instead of time and zone, it's intent and 80, 20 on your days when you're dealing with three days a week, or you're dealing with four days a week or five days a week, six days a week, that gets a little tricky. So we want, you know, we'll see how everything works on this very by the book approach with time and zone. We may try things where it's looking at days and the intent of the days on what you do. And we may end up changing this up and just finding what works best and having some sort of a hybrid as well. So that's the point of getting these plans out and using them. So if you've wanted to use them, please use them because we would really like to get more data on these. And we, I even say we kind of need more data, more people using the polarized plans than those that currently are to get reliable data points. Because we have so many data points on, uh, on how athletes train in general with various different plans. So we'd like to have a lot of data points on the polarized ones. So if you're interested in trying them, please give them a shot. You can just swap the block out on your calendar Right now, if you have a base block or a build block, find that on your calendar, click on the little annotation, and then you can swap it out with one of the polarized ones, or you can just drop one of those polarized blocks onto your calendar. So we give it a shot. So then we can figure it out uh, and get some really cool data on this. So that's the polarized stuff. Uh, now, training plan guide for KOMs. Chad, if you were to do under two minutes, and that's like your... KOM goals that you're going for that, I would say maybe the gravity plan mm -hmm. that we have would be yeah, best. That's the only thing that really emphasizes durations that short. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that would be, and that's, you could drop the block on there or you could do a whole base build specialty into the thing, however you'd like. Right. Yeah. Uh, two to five minutes. What would you say there? Huh. I feel like the crit plan would be pretty good for something like that. You could also do short track. Short track might be pretty good, but short track really thinking. focuses on repeatability. You know? um, but I assume that's what's going on here. It's not going out to, it's not going to ride what two to three hours to go out and do one. So I'm, I'm assuming these are <laughs> repeats. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully that's the case. But you brought up an interesting or an important point, right? From the get-go, that's a broad range. I mean, training to be a specialist in two to 20 minute efforts is, is a huge range. It may not seem like it, but there's a lot of, a lot of ground covered in there in terms of anaerobic reliance versus aerobic reliance versus aerobic reliance in terms of repeatability. 
it's a, it's a lot to train for to be good at all those durations. In fact, you're not going to be the best at all those. There's just no way. It's like, how can I be a Peterbilt and at the same time also be a Porsche? <laughs> you know? Chad, you haven't known many KOM hunters, like truly then, because they absolutely <laughs> really? ride three hours to the climb. <laughs> do one. <laughs> <laughs> three minutes long they do it then yeah, they no. ride home no that makes sense I, 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 okay so i get i understand the context then yeah which okay if you're gonna pursue on the shorter end of things you're gonna look at the two minutes to the five minute climbs for a little while and then train differently to look to, to attack the six to maybe 10 minutes and then train differently to hit mm -hmm. the 11 versus 20 and then a little differently for the 21s versus 60s and 60s it could all work. Sure. But you would yeah. have to compartmentalize your training relative to each of those little durations. If you actually want to be as good as you can be at those individual durations, six to 10 minutes, uh, cross country marathon could be good. Climbing road race could even be good. Rolling road race or yeah. Rolling road race. Rolling road race. Yep. Rolling road race would be better. Good call. 11 to 20 minutes. That's climbing where you're looking race. at climbing road race. Um, you might even start to look at 40 KTT there a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, totally. depending if it's on the longer side, you might want to go toward that, but climbing road race is the jam for that sort of stuff. 21 to 60 minutes, 40 KTT century mm -hmm. or a grand mm -hmm. Fondo plan. Sorry. Yep. Um, as it's Both called, those. those two would be ideal for that. Um, and in even particular, the, yeah, no, you said it 40 KTT. Yep. And then if you get even longer on this above an hour, then you're looking at the, once again, the grand Fondo plan is typically going to do it. Uh, feel free to sub in longer rides if you want to do that, um, uh, whether it's throughout the week, uh, whether it's when you're riding outside and you want to do those two, it's all up to you. So you can pick on plan builder, or you could just pick the training plan. You could throw it on really for those. So hopefully that gives you like a guide. Uh, granted, if you're looking at that, that's one, two, three, four, five, six different, or I guess within his range, it's going to be four different specialty blocks that he could add in. And if you just do four different specialty blocks back to back, and take these KOMs with that intent, it's probably not going to be the best way to find good fitness. You'll need to reset and kind of rebuild into that. So you got to pick your battles. You can't be good at two minute efforts and be good at 20 minute efforts. Relatively speaking, you might be good, really yes. good compared to somebody, but, the best, no. but KOM level. Uh, yeah, probably not. I want to talk into some cheeky KOM tips in general. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you can, the reverse sag is a really good move. So I mean, the best move is just to have your fast friend uh, try out your bike on a climb really quick and <laughs> hop onto the bike. <laughs> Keep or the carry your on there. saddle bag and your bottles. And yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pass everything off to your friend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll be doing that. I'll have Keegan just ride my road bike for a really long time. We're down in Tucson this winter and I'll have him snag me a bunch of KOM. So, um, but there's the reverse sag. So if you're in a group and you're going through something and you really care about KOMs, this will annoy your group, and this will possibly make it so that you will be ostracized and uninvited from your group. However, if you care about KOMs more than friends, which most KOM chasing folks seem to, if that's Loners. the case, yeah, <laughs> then drop to the back of the group before the segment starts, and then just slowly work your way through that pace line so then you finish to be the first one uh, in the group and uh, once you get to the end of that segment. Um, silly little tip that will go a long way to making sure that you are faster than everybody you're riding with because everybody you're riding with is going to be super enthused to find out that you really care about that. So, uh, there's that the other way that you can do this, you can go even more. So there's an app or like an applet online called KOM with the wind. Uh, it combines like surfing <laughs> and KOM stuff. And it basically says which KOMs you would want to go by or go and attempt based on current wind conditions. <laughs> So, <laughs> this is tearing Ivy's soul out. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can do that. Uh, it'll give you like a surf report more or less, and then you'll go out and just uh, find the KOMs that work. Uh, and then outside of that though, if you're going to do KOMs, remember the one tip that I would have is that in most cases, KOMs are short. In most cases, I know somebody out there probably is targeting like a six hour KOM, but uh, in most cases, they're short. So, in that scenario, you're probably not going to be best at chasing KOMs in the base phase, probably not in the build phase, in your specialty phase, depending on the sort of racing you're doing. That's likely when you're going to be better or best at your short things, and particularly post goal race. And then you give yourself a few days to recover. 
go get yourself some crowns because that's likely when you are going to be as fit as you can be, unless you've really drug out of peak until that last goal event. And in that case, you'll probably be in a fatigue hole and probably shouldn't have drug it out that long, but that's like open season is once you are done with your goal event and then you've recovered just a bit and you're ready to go. So Ivy, uh, do they have a track lacrosse category for KOMs? They have e-bike. They have, <laughs> do they have that? <laughs> no, they, they should. <laughs> they, they <are. laughs> oh, that'd be hilarious. Do they really though? I'm like, yeah. they have like e-bike stuff. And then they have, I think there's e-bike KOMs that you can take. I don't know, maybe not, but there's like well, is it like ways. motocross where you have different like you know the the CCs. uh CCs? Yeah. yeah 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 how do you <laughs> I don't know I don't know wild world yeah yeah it's a wild world over there <laughs> having a clue so um I did get uh I did have my first uh pushed off the trail by an e-bike going for a KOM uh, experience this past weekend so usually they're very kind and nice folks um this guy said out of the way KOM and I, uh so I moved out of his way so <laughs> Okay. His motor was worrying. <laughs> so, okay. Steven says, my question relates to injury and adjusting my training plan. I've been using trainer road for a couple of seasons and, have, and, have, and have enjoyed nice gains in my riding performance. So I'm happy to report that your product has helped me make me a better cyclist. Sweet. That's the goal. However, I have been experiencing knee problems and may need to take some time off from cycling. My question is what is the best way to modify or adjust my training plan? Or do I stop my current plan then select train now rides for light recovery? I assume adaptive training will be able to modify rides for me. Um, he says, I'm having my condition evaluated and seeing a physiotherapist. So still getting exercise, just not as much cycling. I've used plan builder in the past to develop training. And I assume that I should start another training plan when I'm able to ride again. Any best, any best practice ideas would be appreciated. Uh, Ivy, you see probably a whole lot of, uh, this in the, on the forum where athletes talk about knee injuries and that sort of stuff. What, what input would you have? You know, we field a lot of questions for athletes uh, trying to come back from illness or injury. Whether they um, use trainer road or not on the forum, it's a common uh, point of discussion. Yeah, totally. And uh, the degree of injury is totally varying from just an isolated knee thing or a lower back thing or um, both knees or something that very clearly seems like a bike fit issue. And uh, so there are good approaches and bad ones and the athletes that do it right are, are doing what um what steven is doing seeing the specialist and it's it's hard to elicit good advice via you know instagram dms people that need help but because we're not doctors but really the best approach is to figure out what's causing that get imaging see a specialist um and that might look like needing to just take time off the bike, you know, um, depending upon the severity of Steven's injury, doing train now rides when it feels okay, still might not be the best approach. And that's where we see a lot of uh, athlete inquiries as well. People that aren't coping well with their injury and write in that, that they've been suffering from this injury for months and try to just incorporate endurance train now rides when they can or something and they're wondering why they don't feel better and they want our advice which is yeah. i think something that you dealt with with a knee injury for a really long time <laughs> totally right? yeah you would never just fully take time off i would never take time off it'd be like oh it hurts again i'm gonna skip today's workout and that was like the most that i did and man it got so bad because i was neglecting and there's a whole post on here. It's, I think it's called knee injuries for cyclists. It's in the forum. You can find it. Lots of people chiming in. I put down pictures of everything that I was the exercises that I do. And I still do those exercises on a weekly basis to try to do that maintenance work that I need in addition to strength training. But I kind of have like a process that I would walk a person through if they're in this case is number one, if you are experiencing like a lot of pain and inflammation, you need to reduce that inflammation and pain to a manageable level and manageable level means that you can live day to day without chronic pain. You need to do that. And if you're just pushing through that and picking more workouts and you're skipping ones every once in a while, but still going with it and just experiencing pain on a chronic level, you need to not. <laughs> so take time that you need to be able to get that inflammation down, address that with diet address that with, um, a lot of different mobility exercises or changing everything up, but you need to get that inflammation down. Once you get that down, focus on mobility, 
So number one, reduce inflammation. Number two, mobility. Mobility is talking about productive range of motion, right? So that's talking about a joints that can explore a range of motion, but doing so with control and being able to productively leverage that, that range of motion that you have. It's not just flexibility, making sure you can do the splits. It's making sure that you have full mobility or full range of your joints, but then you can also productively move throughout that range of motion that you have. So the great resource, Chad's mentioned it many times, Becoming a Supple Leopard by uh, Dr. Kelly Sturett. We've had him on the podcast. You can look up that episode. He's a fantastic resource on finding mobility and being able to maintain mobility as an athlete. It's wonderful. After that, then you can work on strength. So that's where you want to start building up from there. Now that is absolutely, like for me, the biggest differentiator that I find if I slack off on my strength training, I will start to develop instability issues. It's just, and it's very logical, but it happens like clockwork and it's very important to remember. So, but I couldn't do strength training when I had a ton of inflammation, I needed to get rid of the inflammation. And I also couldn't effectively do strength training when I couldn't even squat, right? Because I had such limited ankle and hip mobility that my squat stance and my technique was completely off. Right? So. I needed to take care of these things in succession. And then once I was able to do strength training, it was a huge help. And then that's when you worry about getting faster. So if you're experiencing something like this, don't think I need to do train now rides today. When you're back at step one of trying to reduce inflammation, worry about that later. Um, and, and work those, those rides in later. So Chad, uh, what, any advice that you, you've helped lots of athletes and you've been through this yourself, even just recently uh, with an injury. I think my single bit of advice it would relate to it, it, the nature of the pain. If it's acute, I think you've got some flexibility, but if it's chronic, if it's something you've been dealing with for a long time, see a professional sooner than later. And and this is this recommendation is based on a heck of a lot of experience on my part. And yes, things I've observed, but I'm mostly concerned with me, let's be honest. And when <laughs> when it hurts all the time and I think I've got it figured out and I'm doing something that brings a little bit of relief and I think I'm onto it, I got it figured out, I'm never right. And, and, and the longer I postpone going and seeing a professional and this almost always entails imaging of some sort, at least an x-ray, preferably an MRI, I learned things that there's no way I was going to figure out. The last one I thought was a, a back issue, maybe a hip issue. Turns out I have femurs that aren't shaped like most people's femurs. They're not scalloped in a point where they are. So when I sink down into a deep range, I'm getting bone on bone impingement. This is pushing my acetabulum back into a different place in the, the joint compartment. It's caused uh, issues in a number of places, but there's no way I could have sussed that out on my own. So now armed with that information, I know what I need to avoid doing, what I need to do to rehab uh, the, the, the injured muscles or joints and, and, and what I need to do to prevent further injury by working on muscles that I hadn't addressed, uh, at least not effectively up to that point. So, mm -hmm. and, and this is not the first time this has happened. There's so many times, and I think a lot of us want to WebMD it, super sleuth it, figure, you know, that there's so much information online. I should be able to piece this together by describing my symptoms, plugging it in, finding a YouTube uh, physiotherapy service, maybe paying for it, probably not. In my case, just trying to call what I can from the free stuff and make sense of it. I, I have nobody to blame but me. But the lesson has always been, go see a professional. They're, they're professionals for a reason. They dedicate their lives to learning about this specific thing. And they can help you way faster than you can by trying to piece it together bit by bit over the course of injury after injury, same injury after same injury. Yeah. The, uh, you bring up a good point, Chad, everyone, typically there's like this process that somebody goes through when they go and see a fitter or even like a physio at first and they go, I have a leg leg or le like a leg imbalance, leg length discrepancy. That's usually what they end up saying. And they're like, I have a unique problem and that's why this exists. But mm -hmm. every single person I have not met a single person that has actually gone through this process of imaging and working with somebody who has said, no, I had, I don't have an imbalance. I'm perfectly even left to right. Everyone is somehow different left to right. Nobody symmetrical. Nobody. Yep. Yep. That's how it works. So as a result, that's not a unique problem. Instead, what you should go, okay, so where do we go from here? Where is the imbalance? at and how do we adjust from here? And that's what the professional will actually be able to do with the knowledge that they have. Um, similar to Chad, 
on my left leg, my, my femur actually, or sorry, my, my, uh, my tibia twists and it twists actually a significant amount. It's almost 10 degrees. So the bone basically like on one side, my lower leg is just twisted compared to the other side. And that's just how it is. Right. So, uh, as you'll want to, if you can, and this is really hard because you might not be able to find the person locally. I had to go to bend Oregon, uh, from here in Reno. So, and that was to Dr. Jay Dashari. And he was wonderful because he took a very, he, number one, he's a cyclist. He understands our context. That's very important. Um, you know, when you sit down with your physio and he's like, all right, so do you have speed play zeros or do you have Durace pedals? You know, like he was in the know so that he was able to say, okay, with those pedals, you want to adjust like this for this scenario. So we went through that. And then we went through all the different things that I could do to be able to get mobility and then work on strength thereafter. And it was cool because after I did all the mobility work, which is still very hard and very uncomfortable, but after all the mobility work, I was like, what should I do for strength training work? He's like, oh man, at that point, if you can do all these mobility exercises, it's all the normal stuff. Make sure that you're doing proper squats, Bulgarian split squats, the things that Chad just, we po published on our Instagram recently, strength training movements for cyclists that are really good to be able to, to, to help that sort of stuff is what you can do. Once you get to the point where you're kind of liberated from this deficiency that you have. So don't just stop at an imbalance, dig deeper and find solutions with it. You really have to be proactive because it's not a sort of thing where they can flip a switch and it'll be better. You have to really work at it. So we'll link to that forum thread uh, down there too. I do want to reiterate too, that it can be hard to want to see a specialist when you don't maybe have access to, to them and you don't have to be John and go to a different state to, <laughs> in order to find someone to help you. But it can be hard to want to dish out like a couple hundred bucks to, to go get the help that you need. But it's easy to think about how willing you are to do that for like an upgrade or on our bikes or some equipment. And for me, when I decided that it was a worthwhile investment to figure out what was going on with my body, how much sooner I wish I would have done it and how worthwhile it is. It's hard to decide to do and to merit it when you're not exactly sure what's going on and you think it might just be minor, but it's worth it. All right. Next question from Alex. He says, dear TR team, first of all, thank you. You're doing a great job. I have a question related to FTP and fitness level. I was in peak form somewhere in September after my 2021 A event, I decided to back off a bit for the off season while still continuing training on trainer road and riding outdoors. So I assume that he just like backed off on volume because it doesn't sound like backing off much when you're still doing structured workouts and you're <laughs> riding outside, but I assume backing off on volume is what he's talking about. Maybe not following a plan is specifically, I don't know says my fitness level, and he mentions on a bunch of different platforms is consequently decreasing as I am facing far less training load than this summer. I would expect ramp tests would result in lesser FTP, although the opposite is happening. She says through my last ramp test, my FTP grew by seven Watts in November in comparison to the end of August. He said, which is already his best ever at that point happening at the end of three weeks in the Swiss Alps. That's an important little point there. He says, I thought I would painlessly go through trainer road sessions with such high FTP, but it keeps going. He's like, so now I am puzzled and I do not understand why my FTP keeps growing. Do you have any explanation for what is happening? Truly the most first world of first world problems uh, that Alex is experiencing, but Alex, we're here for it. <laughs> my FTP just keeps going up. I don't know what to do. Please explain. Um, <laughs> Chad, what stands out to you in this one uh, here? I, I have some things that stand out, but let's, let's just go through with you first. Just reducing his training load and seeing better numbers. And, and that's, <clears throat> even if it's a temporary reduction, he's, I think, getting a peek into what it feels like to be fresh for probably maybe the first time in his cycling career ever. I, I think uh, we've talked before how common it is for us to get used to a certain level of fatigue and that, that doesn't disrupt training. You just train through it. You accommodate it because being tired is part of being an endurance athlete. And every once in a while, we get a little glimpse into how good we can feel if we allow ourselves to recover to a point where we are truly recovered. And, and it's, it's difficult <clears throat> because you're, you're always trying to walk that fine line between too much recovery and a, a just the ever so slightest amount of detraining and then staying on top of it and continuing to ride that wave as, as best as possible. So I do understand it. I absolutely can relate to it, but I can also relate to what <clears throat> Alex is describing here where he comes back from a training hiatus of sorts, or at least a reduction in training and sees 
heart rate numbers, power numbers feels just better. So in, in, in this, this typically for me happened November 1st, almost every year that I taught bike classes, because in October, all I did was go and ride outside and enjoy myself, still hit it pretty hard, but I wasn't burying myself in the usual intensity and volume, et cetera. And I would be fascinated by the fact that my heart rate could go to 160. Never, never seen, I haven't seen that in months that I could ride hills at particular power levels. And all of this was unusual. I, I was doing what he's doing, searching for that one thing. What's changed? What's different? Never really recognizing I'm just doing less, which means I'm just more recovered. So I'm not saying this is a matter of simply reducing your training to do to, to, to be less and expect to be faster, but do recognize that when you're always overdoing it, it's really hard to recognize what it's like to actually feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't help but also look at this and see he took, he got that best ever FTP test at the end of three weeks in the Swiss Alps. I would assume that that was a lot of volume that you took in over that time. And if he got a PR directly after that, I assume that if you had rested a little bit and then taken it, you would have gotten an even higher number because that shows that you were probably in a, at least in the state of, in, a, in a state of acute fatigue, right? Uh, just from that, that load that you probably took on with some sort of a trip like that. So this is really common. We see so many athletes that have high, they pick high volume, but they actually get faster when they go down to mid volume or some athletes get faster when they go to low volume. Um, they're able to train more consistently and then they're able to perform better. Their body's able to adapt better to the training because it isn't overloaded. Now, adaptive training will counter for this though. And you'll notice it if you're, you know, regularly, it's very difficult for you to be able to execute the workouts as prescribed. Adaptive training is going to make sure that you're going to be getting the workouts that you need rather than constantly giving you workouts that are too hard. Um, so that kind of goes with it, but this is a very interesting fact. And one of the reasons we created adaptive training and progression levels is the fact that fatigue and freshness really have a masking effect over your ability to express the fitness you have, right? There's always some level of interplay there. It's, it's very rare that you could get a day where fatigue and freshness are not a part of them. In fact, I'd say it's impossible to get a day where fatigue and freshness are not having an effect on your ability to produce work on the bike. So when you look at, that's why when you look at just one FTP test or any testing protocol, particularly the complicated ones, when you take those testing protocols that just put you in a box based on one day, and then you stick with that for a long time, it's difficult. You need something that changes every day because that fatigue and freshness is always going to have an effect on you. So, well, there, there are two ends to the same seesaw. So, I mean, one goes up, the other has to come down and vice versa. So it's, it's, again, it's important to every once in a while, get in touch with what feeling truly fresh feels like, and it may not happen often. But if you can sample it just one time every once in a while, enough to remind yourself of what it feels like, and then, and then remind yourself that this is what I can feel like on race day if I taper properly, you know, maybe the training doesn't change much at all. You just address your recovery relative to your most important events a little more seriously. Then that's how you can and should feel prior to your, your most important events. Yeah. It's like you right now, Ivy in the race season, right? Like you are not just absolutely hammering yourself in between, uh, these race weeks that you've been doing. No. And then I had a rest week and then I set a new all time high FTP yesterday. Hey, way to <laughs> like, go. Good job. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yes, what you were saying is right. Correct. <laughs> yeah. E yeah. Even athletes at the pro level is the same thing. So this is why it's really important to have a base phase that's very productive and to have a build phase that's very productive. And then in that specialty phase, why I recommend to a lot of athletes, even in the specialty phase to drop down your training volume a bit, you can do that really easily in trainer road. Um, because chances are you're going to be, uh, it's usually warmer weather during peak for most events, you tend to target them in the spring, summer, fall, something like that, rather than winter. So you're probably going to be riding outside more and just want to do social riding and doing that sort of thing. So just trying to stick to that same high volume plan add and add in all of that other stuff is a recipe for failure when you need it least, or I should say fatigue when you need it least. So, uh, try consider stepping down once you get closer, uh, to your goal event. Uh, it's a very common approach. And you'll notice that within the plans, they're already built to step down in overall volume, uh, especially since we've, uh, redesigned the plans and their latest iteration based on the data we got, it's, uh, yeah, it steps down a lot. So 
freshness is important. And if you follow a good structured plan, you'll get there, particularly with adaptive training. So congrats, Alex. I hope your problems continue of having an uh, FCP that just keeps going up. <laughs> and having driving yeah. Swiss Alps for several yeah. weeks. <laughs> Shoot, it went up again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thanks everybody for joining us on this podcast, whether it was on YouTube, this is pre-recorded, so we can't get into the live questions, but uh, we're grateful for all of you for joining in on YouTube, listening on whatever podcast app, please share the podcast with your friends. That's a great way to help us and go to trainerroad.com and sign up, start training with us, start using adaptive training. It's overwhelmingly positive. It's so great to see how many athletes are seeing new PRs and just getting huge levels of motivation on the day-to-day of their training, rather than having to wait to see if it all pays off later on. Super cool. So give it a shot. And then if you want to submit a question to the podcast, which I'm so grateful for all of you that do that every week, uh, go ahead and do it at trainerroad.com slash podcast. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.